What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Leaders of Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Ferraro. With me is the, is the expert extraordinaire in Burr Loans, Joe Scaris. How are you? Hey, Michael. How are you? Great, man. So for people who don't know, uh, the National Sales Director at Burr Loans, this is Joe. I've had the pleasure of not only watching him speak live in class, but also had a private conversation with him. And if you're somebody in the residential sales world or an investor, you're going to want to hear this entire podcast through, then also hear about his clubhouse opportunity that he has also for more teaching and guidance. There's going to be a ton of knowledge be dropped on you guys too. But Joe, first, let's give everybody a little bit of a background on you, your history in mortgage, and then we'll kind of dive right into what the hell's happening in mortgage rates in the world right now. Absolutely. So uh, I've been, my name is Joe Scarice. I'm the National Sales Director of Burr Loans. I've been in direct private lending space for about four years, but lending for the past 24 years, uh, since roughly 2000. And I've been a licensed realtor in New Jersey and Pennsylvania since 1988. Uh, I maintain a, a multifamily portfolio, family owned uh, second generation here in the North Jersey market and Philadelphia market as well. A little over 100 doors, everything through between five through 25 multifamily and mixed use. Um, so I maintain that with my family. And we. Uh, I also am ha- a co-owner with my wife of a wellness center and a school for massage therapy as well. So I, I definitely take a holistic approach to my lending environment. I'm also a CE instructor, which Michael I was uh, privy to uh, attending one of my presentations up in Connecticut. Uh, I'm licensed to teach CE on direct private lending, hard money, uh, and traditional lending comparatives, as well as about a dozen other courses throughout the country. And I, I attend various RIAs throughout the country as well. My calendar is pretty stacked. Yeah. Uh, going to uh, be in, I'll be anywhere from LA to Dallas to Phoenix to Oklahoma to Nashville, Tennessee, to Arkansas, to Kentucky and back. Uh, I do love what I do. Um, I do love getting in front of people and meeting and greeting. And there's nothing like live engaged events. Um, but I'm, I'm also, I, I have a, uh, I guess an audio podcast, you would call it, on Clubhouse. I'm the founder of the Creative Burr Strategy Club. And we have about 10,000 followers on there. We uh, educate thousands of attendees that listen and engage every Saturday morning, 8 a.m. and every Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I also have other colleagues that have pop-up rooms scheduled throughout the week as well. But I commit to up to 90 minutes of my time to give back to uh, inv- real estate investors to better understand the market. We have different subjects every Saturday, every Sunday. You know, different slices of burr, meaning buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and redo. We give updates to the market. We try to provide worksheets to educate our borrowers. Uh, we give insight and hopefully strategy. And hopefully we don't get sued because we're not their lawyers or CPA. But we're here to provide a, a consistent theme of integrous education, networking, hopefully creating opportunities. Everybody get all that? This is why, I mean, you got to yeah. take notes when you listen. When you listen to these podcasts and you're, you're, you're getting on here with Joe, you need to bring a pad and paper and be, you know, pen and taking notes. So we're going to break this podcast up into two parts, Joe. The first part's all going to be about the current situation with interest rates and mortgages and what's true, what's false, what's uh, all hype, what's real, some predictions. And let's get into the second part all about Burr strategies in this market. What do you recommend? How do you advise it? So let's kick it off with just dive in, man. What is going on with interest rates today? The market as you see it pertaining to the general real estate market. You can you can pick any type of product specifically, but what what are you seeing out there? What do you think? So listen, the Fed will raise its Fed funds rate on Wednesday by a quarter basis point. Basis point. That's a near certain, right? So the longer term mortgage market has already priced in this information. You know, what will be the critical, you know, what will be critical at the press conference and it's, you know, talk on the future direction of monetary policy. We've obviously had two tremendous impactful uh, banks closed down. Yep. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stress there. The Fed needs to recognize an aggressive interest rate hikes to put toughly half of the small community banks under deep distress. Now, how does that translate into the investor space? 
we don't get impacted with some of this, these banking trades. We're more hedge fund money. We're more more Wall Street money. Uh, we're more – everything's in a, in a business loan format, meaning an LLC. We provide rental loans. We provide fix and flip loans, fix the rent loans, uh, portfolio, blanket loan type of scenarios, new construction. Uh, we do look at multifamily, mixed use. We do uh, revolving construction lines of credit or even unsecured business lines of credit. We're here to pivot and strategize borrowers and put them in the right direction. We're not just a, here to close a loan. I can close a loan easily for somebody because we're asset based. We're looking. We're not looking at tax returns. We're not looking at W twos or ten nine nines. We're looking at the asset. We're looking at the experience of the borrower. But they're not the experience of the bar. We're looking at their their credit score. We're looking at the LLC formation. We're looking at the leverage of the acquisition. And we're looking at the debt service coverage ratio of the property. So we're very strategy driven. We're you know people often confuse us with hard money lenders. Are we a level of hard money? Yeah, I guess you would consider us a flavor of hard money. But I usually break that down in a class on the bridge side. But hard money lenders don't provide thirty year fixed money on the back end through the LLC. So they're, they're, they're kind of a, a one trick pony. We're, we have all four legs. We're Clydesdale. We're, we're, we're plowing through building up the, the strategy to strategize with clients that, you know, they're, they're tapped out at the banks. The banks don't have an appetite to do loans like this. They, they, uh, they want it. They're very restricted. You know, I, I came out of the residential lending space, the resi commercial space. And I talked to a lot of my old colleagues and, and, People that I reported to—they're in trouble. They can't even—they can't even hire the right people right now because there's no business there. You know, the purchase market's flatlined. The MLS is stagnant. Everything's being done off market, and most of it's investor-driven. So, you know, what is a realtor to do? Is a realtor needs to better understand what direct private lending is, take a hold of it, stranglehold it, choke hold it down, understand how to provide you know, the righteous information to their clients that are inquiring really at this point, primarily investment. So, so let's get in a little deeper into the current climate before we get into tips and the burr investing and strategies for investors. But, but just specifically, we know we just had two banks fail that shook up a lot of people. And now we're looking at a situation where there's new mortgage fee structuring with the, with the laws and rules as far as credit scores and that whole thing. Um, do you see this where we're going to be pretty much plateauing here, flatlining as far as the rates, we'll keep them steady, and then you might see a little price increase of inventory is down? Or do you think, hey, we're, we're, looking, at, we're looking at nothing below inventory, nobody's going to want to buy, uh, interest rates continue to go up, and then we're just going to see that kind of happen? Well, listen, the average rate and, you know, and, and Michael, this is not anyone's fault because some of them, some people just haven't been in enough cy economic cycles. But, yeah. you know, the MLS is, is, is completely stagnant. So the, the prices haven't declined further because there's just nothing there. I mean, it's the same inventory. OK, so lack of new listings prevent home prices from declining pretty much throughout the, the entire country, right. depending on where you're at. So, right. If you don't have new listings and the bank REOs and foreclosures haven't hit the market yet, which I thought it was going to all hit by the end of third quarter, early fourth, because we have a lack of labor processing these REOs and foreclosures, I really don't see this impacting our markets probably till the mid first first quarter of next year. And will that impact spring market? Absolutely. I, I think we'll be in a full blown buyer's market. I think we really are in a buyer's market. Because I just think that, you know, with inflationary costs and, and people losing reserves and savings because of inflation costs, they don't still have the money to or the risk to overpay for a piece of real estate right now. They'd rather stay and rent and wait and see what this market looks like. I mean, all values are showing a decline anywhere between 5 and 12 percent, depending on what market you're in. I don't see, uh, you know, flippers lining up to... to uh, on, you know, sell properties at, at premium prices. You're already having, you know, developing groups like Lennar selling off midway completed uh, developments to hedge funds to build the rent or to make it completely a rental community. So we're going toward a completely rental community. You have eat, work and live build outs going right now. You have commercial spaces converting or requesting to make massive changes to the master plans throughout every urban city throughout the country, because most of these commercial buildings are going to go completely empty. 
yeah. or they're at near 30 or 40 percent occupancy at this point. And what do you do if you've got a completely empty commercial building? You better figure out how to reposition that building right. or it's going to be a knockdown over the next decade. And right. then you're just all you're doing is rebuilding uh, rentals at that point. So right. and then, you know, the concern of crime and, and safety and the barrier of entry. You know, if you watch the migration reports, whether it's United Van Lines, Penske, U-Haul, uh, most of the Midwest and Southwest is extremely impacted because it's a better barrier of entry. Irony enough, Florida's not in the top 10 of movement right now because it's too expensive now to live there. Even North Carolina's kind of popped out. Now, you know, the, the flavors of the, of, of the the country right now is Ohio, Indiana, Oklahoma, uh, New Hampshire, which is above you in the Connecticut market, uh, yeah. Maine even at because the barrier of entry is is lower. The tax base is lower. Um, I think like Oklahoma, like Arkansas, Kentucky's doing very well. Tennessee's doing very well. So and it, another surprise market, which is not a surprise to me, is Wisconsin, like that Madison, Milwaukee market. People are getting the heck out of Chicago. They, you can get shot in downtown or jump, you know, any day of the time, day of the week. So, right. you know, the concern of safety, the concern of uh, barrier of entry, uh, quality of life, it's it's steering away from uh, a lot of places where people did were frog, frogging back into, and now it's a complete reverse. You know, you're seeing in the Philadelphia market a 400,000 shift in population. I mean, that, I mean, if you if you see anything in the newspaper every day, I mean, it, I would be concerned about living in Philadelphia as well. So, again, this is not uncommon sense. This is completely common sense movement to the markets. What do you what's your take on when a lot of these people who either did commercial loans on five year arms reset with higher rates and they can't and then there's job layoffs and people, you know, people moving out or they can't make the payments. And now you have these higher loans that doubled in some places. Um, you th we have that whole market coming in too, right? Well, I mean, some of the bigger syndication syndicators out there will survive because they have enough doors out there to 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 uh, sustain uh, the uh, the fallout of their miscalculations and mis underwrites that they did over the past five years because they didn't they didn't predict there was going to be a three to four hundred basis point shift in their in their rates. They were right. They weren't underwriting seven and they under evaluated deals. Right. Yeah. Now right. you're at 70 percent and, you know, they can't get a capital call from their investors. I think you're going to have a very large sell off of turnkey multifamilies from syndicators that cannot reposition the, 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 the asset and cannot get a capital call from their investors. They're going to have to unload to pay back their investors. It's going to be kind of a licking of the wounds. Um, but that's OK. I mean, listen, that's how this how this pendulum is going to work. I mean, do I think rates are going to come back to reality three, four years down the road? Yeah, about 36 months, I think we'll be back in the fours and fives. But I don't think we're going to ever get back to down to the twos and threes anytime soon. So that's that was an anomaly. And, uh, you know, that was maybe a one time, you know, hit in in, in our era. You know, what I mean, I, I might not see that in my lifetime. That might not that might be in another lifetime, but not in mine. With, and with artificial intelligence, AI making a massive shift into the market, your appraisal uh, services and management services are going to have a complete shift over the next 24 months, if not sooner. Uh, you're going to have more virtual appraisals being done. So what does that do to values if they're just doing virtual drive-bys? We, we're talking a 10% shift in values automatically go, pointing down. So again, AI is going to do a lot of contraction initially and then re-expand the markets back out over the next 10 years. I think everybody's going to be impacted by AI over the next two to three years. Okay. So on the investor side, um, you know, this is a super, let's take, let's take an investor wanting to get into the market here. Um, and the first thing that they're going to say is not even what kind of investment do I look at? Or do I do, you know, uh, multifamily buy and hold? Do I do the burr? They're going to say, sh should I take this 200 grand and do it now? Or should I wait till the market shifts? And we had for the, couple of months prior, it was very much, wait, just wait, just wait. And now I'm hearing, yeah. you can't wait anymore. You can't wait. Now's the time to do it. You know, and I'm hearing more of a push of like, now you got to do it now because these rates are only going to go up and values are only going to go up. I'm, it's a little bit of mixed messaging. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. So what's your, what's your thought on what somebody would say? Hey, Joe, I got 200 grand. Can I, should I do it now or wait? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, you make money when you're buying. 
I mean, you're going to need to pencil down a little harder. So just because lenders are willing to give you up to 70% LTV on after repair value to do a burst strategy, doesn't mean you have to exercise and buy it, buy it at 70% LTV based on ARV. If I was an investor with 200 grand on sidelines with decent credit and ready to rock and roll and buying investment properties, I'd be evaluating my deals buying at 60 to 65% LTV based on after repair value, keeping my repair costs at 35% or under on the based on the purchase price, no more than 50% for that matter. Because time and time kills deals and time also kills equity on the back end if your construction or renovation takes too long. So if you're right. buying at 60 or 65%, you're doing like I'm not saying like lipstick on a pig, but maybe a little bit above that. But like I said, between the 35 to 50 percent rule of purchase price, and you're moving and grooving on turning these properties over, getting them rented, getting them stabilized, turning them into a 30 year loan. And if it works at a debt service coverage ratio right now at a seven and a quarter rate, say that's the average rate right now, and it still works at that. So what happens when the rates move down to four or five percent and you're at seven and a quarter in, in, in three years? Refinance. What happens? Refi. Yeah. And what do you, what do you think your cash flow is going to be? The, the lot, you, lot better. 300 percent more. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you, yeah. and then you're re-amortizing over another 30 years. You're spinning off way more cash flow. So you bought correctly at seven and a quarter. Your debt service was one point two or better. You have enough equity in a deal because you bought it correctly at 60 to 65 percent based on LTV. So does it really matter when you buy? It's how you buy. You make money when you buy. So, you know, yeah. having that type of strategy talk and spreading the money out, I, I, a great example, uh, a victory garden. You know, when a victory garden is created in your backyard, and I'm probably aging myself saying a victory garden, but you, you, you put fertilizer, you put uh, uh, moss, you put peat moss, you, 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 you till the ground, okay? So 200 grand, to me, that's two or three deals and you're recovering all your money back on a refinance. I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. I spread that out, spread that garden out, fertilize that correctly, get a couple doors in different places. But if you're a newer investor, don't go for a lopsided deal where you're buying something for a hundred and the renovation's 150 and you see the big number on the back end, a half a million. You've never done anything. That's not your first deal. We have to have more of a strategy talk. You need to understand how to buy correctly up front. That's why I provide complimentary worksheets to underwrite your deals. And then I, I provide also complimentary worksheets to understand the back end, the hold. And then I also put together a construction budget and draw schedule template for you to better understand what to look for when in, in evaluating a deal to renovate. So I, I leave you very prepared. And then I have obviously referral partners in the unsecured business lines of credit space that are very important in my support staff. So having the right support staff, having the right realtor, having the right lender, having the right attorney, having the right CPA, the right home inspector, the right GC, the right property management company, the right home warranty individual, the right uh, button up guy or gal that does button up work. These are very important people in your, your team and your support staff. Spot on. Perfectly said. It's it's formulaic. It's, you're not going to get hurt if you stick to the fundamentals. It's when you try to go be rogue out there and do something you haven't really done and something you don't really understand and try to always go for that quick buck. It's been my uh, my life story that I get burned that way. So sticking to the fundamentals. I want to ask you because you, you're all in on Burr. And there's a lot of different strategies people can have in the investing world that they can subscribe to, to get the end goal. There's people who want appreciation. There's people who are flipping. There's people who are doing uh, wholesaling. There's people who are just the traditional buy and hold. What's your view and why is Burr the way to go? Uh, maybe for a particular person. And let's dive in a, little, a little bit more into that. Well, I mean, listen, you're creating forced, you're, you're creating forced, uh, equity in a deal by a, 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 taking a blighted property and turning it into a stabilized property. Uh, are there a lot of those out there right now? There's always properties that are in trouble. There's always somebody in trouble. I don't care if it's good times or bad times. There is always somebody in trouble. 
So you need to identify those opportunities by, you know what, you know who you need to team up with if you're a solid realtor, a very solid several wholesalers in different markets, because wholesalers are spending the money wisely, identifying the blighted opportunities that are out there, whether it's probate or whether it's free and clears or whether it's uh, reverse mortgages that are going sideways or FHA or VA loans going sideways. They know what data to identify. And they, they have the virtual assistant setups, making phone calls. I see a, a, a wholesaler spending 10 times more money than an average realtor in one year, in one month. So, you know, who am I going to hang out with? People that are investing into themselves, into the business and getting entrenched. So if I'm going to be behind somebody to identify these deals and these opportunities, I really personally think that they should be doing a national license for wholesalers and just get this crap out of the way and recognize wholesaling as a true industry by uh, licensing the whole thing up. It's already happened in Chicago. It's already happening in Philadelphia. It's already happening in the state of Oklahoma, the entire state. You can't wholesale a deal in Oklahoma unless you have a wholesale license. Just make it a nationwide thing so you clean up all the crap. There's, listen, there's unethical people behind every license that's out there. All you're doing is narrowing the lane for the, the, the non-integrists to know that they're being watched now, okay? Give it a recognition what it needs. Give the whole wholesale industry what it what it deserves because that's all, I'm telling you, the best deals that are out there that are even deals to look at are wholesale deals. So whether you're a licensed realtor, you're a licensed banker, I, I have six or seven wholesalers always tagging me up. I'm teaming up with them. I'm setting up referral programs for them. Because they're on the front line talking to people and discussing people in distress. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, and that, they're going to be able to be working the, you know, and I guess this leads to my second question, which I was going to say is, who's a Burr investing strategy? And again, to repeat for people who don't know, that's a buy, rehab, rent, refinance. Um, that process we'll talk about in a second, but I was going to say, who's best suited for a Burr? And it's maybe somebody who is, they can be in real estate, not be in real estate, but they're going to leverage the wholesaler to find the deal that de that wholesaler is going to trade you the deal. And they're already finding that distressed seller. Cause that's, what's really your whole formula is based off of buying 60, 65% of after repair value. Right? So that's only going to come from a property that's going to need that work. And somebody who's doing great, making a ton of money who doesn't need to sell is not going to, they're, they're not, you know, that, that property is not, going to be best suited for the burr strategy it's going to need some work and wholesalers are the ones digging into the weeds looking for those properties and those distressed sellers so that's that's who it is but furthermore than that joe the burr strategy is great because it's always been told to me that you know you have this lump sum of money you want to make sure you get maximum return on your money you want to give yourself both the ability to Get what kind of a, a wholesaler flip does, which is get your money back out and then a little bit of a profit. But also you want to have that repeat cash flow and that in, and the income producing asset. Um, so the perfect Burr scenario you gave me was the 60, 65% LTV, 35% of after repair cost. But give me a, give me a little bit down the road. Like you, okay, I, I was able to work with a wholesaler. I found a property. Um, it's a million dollars. I think the after repair value is 1.6. Um, what is it that you're looking for now from the going in rental situation and go to that second part of the deal and how, how that's best suited for the, the buyer? So this is where you have to tie in with, with a couple of relationships here. You know, you need to understand your rental comps, okay? Because when somebody does an appraisal for the refinance part, the redo, you need to know that the the, the rental income will support the debt service of 1.2. And that spreadsheet that I, pre, I provide to anybody that attends one of my classes or even attends one of the clubhouse you know, strategies courses on the weekends, I send them to them and I set up a 15-minute chat with them to run the scenario to better understand, does the rental on the back end make sense with the newfound debt leverage that you created by buying and renovating the property? Okay. Right. So I'm going to take one step back to go three steps forward. Okay. Your wholesalers are grabbing the good deals now because now that they don't need tax returns and W-2s and 1099s to get a loan and they can come to an asset-based lender, 
you're the, the investor is, is somewhat seeing the scraps. OK, and this is another thing. A good partner in this in, in this business now more than ever because of labor shortages is a good contract. OK, I think the general contractor and the wholesale are going to take over the investor market over the next decade. And the investors are going to be just investing into them to make their profitability because an investor that's W2 doesn't have the time to go identify a good general contractor at seven o'clock in the morning at Home Depot. They don't have time to identify a good wholesaler when they're working a job making 150, 200 a year. They got time to invest and partner with somebody. So I think partnerships and joint ventures are going to be a, another good step to evaluate what will that rental look like on the back end and who's going to be managing that property out and who's going to be facilitating the ongoing deferred maintenance on that property. Is it a property management company? Is it the GC that you're partnering with? What does that relationship look like? And that's, you know, partnerships are very interesting. You know, I always talk about partnerships like marriage and divorce. You know, you got to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to a partnership. And that's where a good real estate attorney is going to kind of ravel all that together. Because if you're going to go into a long-term hold with somebody, you better know them. And you better understand that refinance component because if they don't have the credit score and you do, now you're kind of in favor. But I'm seeing more GCs and wholesalers, excuse me, that are much better accredited and financially now than 10 years ago. So the, the, the cycle is shifting where the wholesaler realizes you have to have that 680 or plus credit score or even 660 for that matter. The GC knows they have to have a 660 credit score if they're going to be a true partner in building up generational wealth with real estate portfolio with somebody. And they have cash reserves because they're busy. A good GC, they're booked out two, three months in advance. They're, I, I have some craftsmen that I'm friends with. We you know grab dinner and stuff like that. They're booked out six months in advance. So – to get that partnership with one of those those guys or gals, you need to really have, obviously, a very serious commitment in partnering with them, but also now you're in bed with them, okay? Not just on the short term, but also on the long term of that asset. So you got to really think all this through. And I know it's really easy to throw out, hey, I'm looking to do JV partnerships on Facebook groups. I see that all the time. I run two groups on Facebook that have close to 20,000 people in each group, and I see it all the time. And I'm like, I don't even know these people. Why would I JV with them? I'm not a fan of it, but what I'm saying is it's it's going to be extremely common practice because how do you get into these deals on the back end and hold these things long term? You got you got to keep up you got to give up 50% ownership or 40% ownership, 30% ownership. What's the cash on cash return of that asset if it's only making you $400 a month? So what the debt service 2.0, but what are you going to sit around with a partner there for $400 a month? I don't know. So there's a lot of things to think about how you progress in understanding the refinance piece to any of these type of properties if you're going to partner with somebody as well. So you refinance. So you're basically saying you buy that property at a million. You're going to get in there. You're going to be doing the renovation work. You're going to be re-renting out the units or having to restabilize the units. Right? It might have to be getting some people out, bringing in some new tenants, doing that process. It's yep. going to take some time. It's going to take money. Um, and you might have used hard money to be able to do that which is going to cost you well, monthly. You don't have to use hard money because direct private lenders offer bridge money. So Got it. my rates start at 9.75 where a hard money lender starts at, at 10 or 11 or 12% for that matter. My origination is one to two points. They might be two to four points. So you see where the difference is? Yeah. We're closing at the same amount of time too. We're closing within 15 to 20 days. So there's nothing different from a direct private lender and a hard money from a bridge perspective. But it's more efficient and better your way, do, going it through the, what you're talking well, about. Well, we're we're having a much more deeper strategy talk. I'm not saying that hard money lenders are predatory, but they're only looking at that solo deal because they, they need to recover that asset if you go in default. Right. I'm looking at the whole picture. I'm looking at – I mean, I'm just not a fly-by-night lender. I, I, I've been yeah. in I, – I have a – I have a flag down in a, a 24 years of experience. I have my brand, my reputation. You know, people ask me why I left lending one is because I was turning away more customers than bringing them in because of restrictions. Right. So now the handcuffs are off. In a matter of two to three weeks, we, we've submitted over 50 loans where probably three quarters of those I couldn't do before. So you tell me, is it a, am, am I in a better picture of can of, of the paint of canvas. I had a, right. a new blank canvas and now I'm painting this beautiful picture for a much broader 
platform of investor. Got it. So then you go and you you do that, you refinance, but when you refinance, what's going to happen now is now you're going to have a certain amount of debt service, probably into that 30 year, 20 year, whatever it is that your loan program that you're refinancing. 30 year, in. typically you get either a five or 10 one arm, a 10 one interest only, or a 30 year fix. That's pretty much the options out there. And you're talking on a Max commercial out loan? Max 75% LTV. On What's a commercial, that? on a commercial multifamily loan, yeah, uh, up to seventy five percent on cash out, eighty percent on purchase. Again, depending on the debt service coverage ratio on the back end of the property, whether it's turnkey or or a repair, like a rehab loan. So there's a lot more flexibility. Banks are offering five one arm with a fifteen or twenty year amortization. Those numbers are real tight, and then they're going to underwrite you to death. Right, they're going to collect right. tax returns, W twos, yep. ten ninety nines. They're going to do yep. a full investigation of your entire life. Gotcha. So, so, and, and typically in a burr strategy, which, you know, I guess the pro and the con of it is the, the con is it takes time. It takes time. You have to have a good team. You have to know what you're doing. It's not something you're going to be in and out in 30 days. There's a whole restabilization process and a loan process in a burr strategy. What's that timeline look like for you normally? What do you say? I, I mean, listen, realistically, we don't have a seasoning issue on refinancing. We have a no seasoning product. We can refinance the property the day after you, you buy the property, okay? Um, but realistically, most of my clients, they're, re, they're buying a property. They're throwing some rehab into it. Now you got to identify the right tenant, okay? This is art of war now because now the landlord-tenant laws are completely different. They're in yep. favor of the tenant just nearly everywhere throughout the country. So the vetting process of getting the right tenant, whether it's – low income or to a plus rental you you got to do the same background checks the same investigation there's massive restrictions throughout the country on uh, against the landlord i mean it's like like the landlord's enemy number one and the tenants like you know, like they wear the superman costume okay which it's beside i'm beside myself because like how does the government think that landlords can sustain themselves I question that politically, but what I'm saying is at the end of the day, the landlord has to vet, you know, probably a hundred applicants, right? Most of them are going to be crap. Most of them are going to be, there's question marks. So realistically, you're going to take two months to vet out a good tenant, right? So you're, no matter what, whether you clean the place up in a month and you stabilize it with a lease, signed lease to show the income production of the property, you're technically probably at 90 days anyway, right? I mean, that's typically, and then we start the refinance when we see a lease signed and we're basing it off the income, we match it up with the market rents and we make match it up with the appraisal. And then we refinance the property and whether there's cash out for it or it's, it's cash neutral, you know, we, we talk about that to see what the cost benefit is to take cash out or just to pay off the extinguished debt. We have those mm -hmm. discussions, but yeah. we also, what I do is try to prepare a client for the what ifs. What if they screw up on the draw schedule? And they missed something and it cost $10,000. Do you think I'm going to readjust my draw schedule just because you screwed up? No. Where does that ten grand come from? That's why I want to make sure you have the proper reserves. You have the what if. I set them up with unsecured business lines of credit. I get a client way more prepared so there's no fallout and no time delays to get that project done and completed. Right. Right. Love it. Um and I'm kind of going through this process a little bit myself. And so I can speak firsthand. The, it is really, really awesome to watch how this goes and watch how you set it up and to w talk with somebody like Eric and how that whole thing works. Cause I didn't, you know, it, if you're not fully educated on it, you only see this in pieces. You hear sound bites, you understand, well, this, the reason for, you know, credit for this or financing for this or why, but I, I'm now watching the entire thing being set up and how you're doing it kind of in a mentorship role and advising, it's amazing to see how many things I would completely miss and how much mistakes, how many mistakes people would be making if I was advised on this and see this whole picture coming through with the reserves and how would you, it's, it's crazy how uneducated people are just because they want to get into this, they hear little bits, but they're not working with the best. And, um, and that's, yeah, it's. I see where this whole thing goes. I wanted to ask you, did you want to add anything to that? Because I had another question. You know, you have to look at the whole picture. If somebody's not having at least a, a 10, 15-minute discussion with you to understand what your goals are, 
Right. You got to question what their objective is with you. Okay. It's, it, you know, I like to see the whole picture and there's no way you could just call me and I could figure it all out over the phone. I need to understand your personal financial resume. I need to understand what your capabilities are, what your experience is, what your, what, what experience you don't have. What's right. your support staff look like right now? Um, am I going to be part of that support staff or are you just trying to get information off of me? Like which one is right. it? Okay. Right. And I, I, I'll have those frank talks because I don't have to work with everybody and nobody, not everybody has to work with me, but I have, my time has a value. So I wait, everything has a cost benefit relationship. So you got to weigh that out. If you're going to get deep with somebody, you better, you better reciprocate and, and provide them the business because, you know, if I have a couple 15 minute talks and I'm not seeing anything bearing there, I mean, I'll be, I'll be cordial in my call, but I'm going to like, I'm going to start not giving the amount of time because now I feel like I'm wasting time. So Get it, being right. an analysis paralysis with, with a, a, the proper support staff doesn't work in your favor long term. Right. Exactly. People are going to be see right through that. They're going to smell that right out. So if you're going to do this, folks, and you're listening and you're watching and you're going to take up Joe and his time on these calls because he is very generous and he's got a, a big heart, but don't waste his time. So if you're a, if you're a real estate investor and this is what you're going to do or want to do, um, yeah, there's there's. You're going to be in for a lot of education, but this has really got to be something you want to do. I mean, if you're just dabbling, learn about it, pick up a book. There's a million different resources to just dabble, but this is, this is to seriously get you up and running in your real estate investing. I want to ask you on the burr, um, because a little bit more nuance, do you have a size that you think works well as far as size property? And I'll just, you know, you know, the commercial we know is five units and over. Do you, where do you think that falls to perfect if there is one sweet spot? I mean, I like a market that has a value on the back end anywhere from 175 to 250 initially. And that might not be in your market where you're sitting, but I like that from a cash flow perspective and a debt service coverage ratio perspective and a barrier of entry. Okay. There are markets out there between that 175 and 300,000 type of market that the rents support himself, whether it's a one through four investment property. So you got, you have to see where is that barrier of entry? Where is that market that you need to invest in? And does that match up with what your comfort level is? If you're going to become an out of state landlord instead of an in state landlord to wherever you're buying and, and owning. So it's a deeper discussion. Um, you need to be comfortable with it. But I think with the barriers of accessibility through so many different routes, whether it's meetup groups and RIAs and investor groups throughout the country, you could do, you can go to a market, get to really learn it a couple months in a row, three, four, five months, get comfortable going to a group and building out your support staff. And then suddenly you're the out-of-state landlord in that market and really depending on where you're at. I mean, again, your comfort level, it has to make sense. But you, but so there's a lot of people who subscribe to the idea that I, I have to have a five unit above, maybe five to 25, five to 50 unit, because I have to have a commercial and I don't have to have them all in one building. It'd be nice if they were, but I could spread my portfolio out, but I got to have commercial loan. I can't do any four units and under. Um, what, what, did, what's your thought on that with the burr? Well, I mean, again, I, I don't really suggest you jump it out to a uh, five unit if you have never owned an investment property before. Buy a two right. unit. Learn how to be a landlord. Learn how to hang a picture. Learn how to build a support staff that supports that two unit. Maybe buy another two unit. Then if you're going to buy that five through 25 unit, buy it in the same immediate area where you have those couple investment properties because then you already have the support staff on the ground. It's boots on the ground. So – I, I, if I was going to, I don't suggest jumping to a five through 25 environment if you have zero experience. Two, a lender is not going to get real comfortable with that unless you have an investor that has that level of experience. We're just right. not going to lend on that because I, I'm, I'm thinking you're going to fail. Right. Is it, does it, but if you keep to the, so let's say you have some experience, you know what you're doing, you're in the market. Um, this is not your first rodeo, I'm not saying you're, you have a huge portfolio. And you stick to that formula, and now you're looking in that five to 25 units. It would be your idea <clears throat> to maybe not put all your eggs in one basket. Don't do the just the one building that you know brings you in $25,000 a month. Spread that out a little bit more. I think there's going to be a sweet spot between that five and 25 market that small balance area throughout the country. I think I've talked to a lot of professionals in the field. 
everybody's thinking big. Everybody's thinking 50 unit or 25 and above. And right. they kind of forgot about that five through 25. And most of those properties are typically listed incorrectly. Most of those five through 25 properties are great off market opportunities because most yep. people don't even know how to evaluate them. Um, so if you know how to really evaluate a deal and understand the debt service of that property, don't worry about cap rate. Throw that out the window. F focus on the debt service of that property. Okay. Don't worry about cap rate. That, 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 that makes people want to impress themselves that they know the term. I don't really care about it. I don't want to talk about it on this podcast at all. Understanding debt service on a 5 through 25 is going to find you a lot of opportunities because most real estate agents don't know how to underwrite them. They don't know how to market them. They don't know how to list them. Stay away from the light office retail and mixed mix use storefronts unless it's really good storefronts. Um, and, and I'd stay with stri strictly residential, multifamily, 5 through 25. I think it's a strong market throughout the country, and I think that's going to be a, a very strong platform to be in. It's under the radar. There's plenty of financing for it out there, 30-year money, fixed money, or 5 or 10 one-arm options out there on 30-year amortization. Take advantage of the 30-year amortization on those properties. Await the market shift and the rates in your favor over the next couple of years. I think it's a sweet spot. Generational wealth can be built a lot of different ways, but if you're looking for a great return, way to keep your money that you're investing, do it smart. And one of the best <clears throat> asset classes, which is um, commercial multifamily. Um, I own a, I own a four unit <clears throat> and that's been great to me, but if you, but there's really a way through this strategy, if you do it right, that you can build some really great generational wealth and probably be some of the most protected real estate that you can have. But it, then it starts to get into asset protection insurances, which, being in the CE class with you, Joe, was amazing to listen to how you talk about protecting yourself as well. I mean, your your knowledge is just insane. And, you know, I'm very lucky to uh, have spoken to you privately, we're working with you and then have, and then everybody listening, be lucky to be on this podcast, to be hearing him. He can't give all his information and his knowledge in this podcast, but he's given you guys a lot. Joe, I want to ask you, <clears throat> There's probably stuff that I missed. I want to cover it. I want to talk a little bit more about your clubhouse, uh, the platforms, um, different ways people can get in touch with you and and then kind of sign off here. So let's get into, is there anything that I didn't talk about before we get into clubhouse that you want to talk about? No, I mean, listen, you really just want to have a, a strategy talk, 15 minutes. Let's get it all out there in front of us. It doesn't matter what day of the week is. I'm, I'm typically coherent from... 7.30 a.m. when I get back from the gym to 9, 8 p.m. in the evening, Saturdays and Sundays. And listen, no one is that busy to not take a phone call. So if you think you're that busy, then I'm not the right guy to be with. You know, because if I can make the time, you can make the time. Right. And um, I, I'm typically accessible from either text or call. And it ties right back into the Creative Burst Strategy Club that, that I'm the founder of on Clubhouse. I, you know. As you know, Michael, there, there's a lot of uh, questionable investor groups live, live questionable groups. There's no difference than on, on podcasts and things of that nature, especially on Clubhouse. So my thought was to put a very integrous educational platform on a podcast through Clubhouse. And it's it's obviously worked very well. I mean, we had an event just recently in Philadelphia. We had 200 people in attendance. OK, wow. I know another group that's 10 times bigger than my club. Guess how many people they had at their event this past weekend? 20. 50. They had 50, yeah. They had 50 people to my 200. And, and my club is 10 times smaller in followers because what we're providing on a consistent basis is true education. It's a true subject. It touches a chord with someone to better understand something that's inside their circle that they need to address as a real estate professional. That's it. Yeah. And so- if people want to get in touch with you, <clears throat> what's the best sure. way for them to do that? There's two ways. 215-290-5108. That's 215-290-5108. Text or phone, either one, or my email, jscarese, that's J-S-C-O-R-E-S-E, -E, J-S-C-O-R-E-S-E, -E, at burr, four R's, dot com. So jscarese at burr, dot com. Now, if they want to set up that conversation with you, do they just do that by emailing and calling you? Email, text, and then I send them an email, send them some dates and times. Let's get it set up. Okay. I'm going to post all that information um, on this so that people can see it. They can click on it right in the description. 
Um, and if you have any other questions for Joe, please reach out and, and talk to him. If you have any questions for me about what some of the process has been like, cause I'm doing it, um, please feel free. I, I love to tell you, cause this is, this is probably one of the best experiences as far as real estate investing education that I've gotten and going through the process myself. And I've been in real estate for some time. I'm an investor and I have some really big goals. So if you're in that same boat and you want to learn from one of the best and you want to actually do this, um, Joe is absolutely the guy to go to. So I want to thank you again, Joe, for coming on. It's really been a pleasure. You're an inspiration and a great mentor to talk to. Michael, thank you for the time and really appreciate your, your time today. Have a great day. You got it. All right, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Leaders of Lifestyle Podcast, Michael Farrow, Joe, the man, reach out to him. We'll talk to you next time. Take care, guys.